begin. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that occasionally in recent meetings I've been a little self-indulgent and run late. So this morning we've got a new piece of technology to help me uh, focus on the task at hand, which is finishing on time. So in view of that, let's uh, get rolling and post the agenda. As you see, uh, fewer items today and only one large presentation. That's the cemetery records one. Um, I did have a, quite an extended uh, presentation for the um, searching the archives, but clearly it's way too long. So what I'm going to do is take a um, leaf out of the book of the cinemas in the 50s when we were all young whippersnappers and just give you a trailer for that and send you off to watch it in your own time. But let's begin with our first two minute tip. And this was uh, one which has basically by popular demand. A couple of meetings ago, Paul spoke about the tremendous success that he had had in obtaining lots and lots of free records from TNA. And a few people said, well, that's terrific for Paul, but how does he do it? And he has very generously agreed to tell us exactly. Today I'm going to take you to the UK National Archives. I'm going to virtual, of course, but it will still be good because we're going to get something or nothing. We will do the longer, broader TNA session at a later date, but today we're focusing on downloading the digital image for free. You need to search for what you're looking for at the TNA search site called Discovery. This is the URL here. And if we go there at the top in the red box, it says sign in users can download digital records for free. And in the red oval, there's a place to sign in or register if you don't already have an account. It's simple and free to register and sign in and you can do it at this stage or leave it until later. So I've been searching here, you can see that I found the record I was looking for and because I'm not signed in, it shows a cost of £3.50. So now I really need to sign in. Having signed in, it now shows that it's free. The next, next step is to preview, preview the record image, image to make, make sure, sure it's the right, right one. So, so click the little, little down arrow where the red, red arrow, arrow is pointing. pointing. That, that will reveal the image, image but, it's but it's small. small. So, so we want to enlarge it to full screen, screen by clicking, clicking on, on the icon, icon the red arrow, arrow is pointing to. That, that enlarges, enlarges the image and you can even zoom, zoom in further, further if you want one, using the magnifying glass or the scroll wheel on your mouse. Then you'll be able to read most of the record well even though, even though it has a watermark on it. But we need to get out of the full screen to get back to the ordering page. Now that we know it's the record we want, we can order it by clicking Add to Basket. The display changes to show Go to Basket. So click on that. The next screen shows you order details and a button to the checkout. Click that. Tick the Accept terms and conditions box and select submit order. The order confirmation screen allows you to download your image. And if you click on that, the download will appear in the system tray of your PC from where you can open it. And here it is. And there are five other Tuppen metal cards on the same page. Now that's a bargain. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Uh, my apologies for the uh, dual sound at the beginning of that. Uh, this monkey has too many toys to play with on uh, at the one moment. But uh, if you do want to, and I'm sure you will want to watch Paul's two minute tip again, let me just tell you that they are available or they will be available from our website and 
if we just flick up this screen. You can find that by going to our Weebly site and um, clicking on more hints and all of the two minute tips are there for you. So, um, so far I'm doing well on sticking to time. So let's move on to today's news and gossip and I'll watch very carefully where the sound is coming from. Well, news and gossip this week. The first big item is thank you to everybody who responded to our suggestion of an end of year gathering in Pine Rivers Park. Um, universal acceptance of the idea, so just get in your diary, 24th of November in Pine Rivers Park. We'll all gather in an appropriately distanced manner and um, round out the year. Second piece of news, not quite so joyous perhaps. You will remember that I, at the last meeting I indicate that I had scheduled another virtual meeting for November the 10th. Well, that has now had to be cancelled. The reason is simply that on the morning of November the 10th, I need to be somewhere else. And I'm hoping that you'll join me there. Yep, we are going back to the library. I want to acknowledge the tremendous support we've received from Moreton Bay Region Library staff, both at Strathpine and in the local history area, the team there. Um, they couldn't have been more helpful and accommodating and uh, really looking forward to uh, getting back to face-to-face -face sessions from our very next meeting. Not quite business as usual. The health directives require that um, we stay one and a half metres apart when we're in the library and that when we arrive we have to provide our contact details to the library so that they can track us down in the event of any infection in other people in the library. Now the consequence of that is that um, we can only have 30 people in the library at one time, which as I hinted in a previous tween meeting news, on the face of it says we can't meet, but I think it's absolutely essential that we get back together. So what I've discussed with the very helpful staff at Strathpine is that we would divide that morning of the 10th of November into two sessions, one beginning around 8.45 going through to 10 o'clock. Those people will then move out and then we start a second session and 10.30 to 11.30, 11.45. It's unfortunate that we can't all be together, but I think it's the very best we can do. So watch your email in the next couple of days when I'll be asking you to indicate which session you would prefer to be in. Now, obviously, some of you will want to get together with uh, colleagues and make sure that you're in the same session, and that's fine. If some catastrophe occurs and the, com the combined bookings for the two sessions are less than 30, I will advise you in the day or so beforehand, and we can all roll up and meet as one big group. But um, my feeling is we probably will be operating on two short sessions, but clearly it's going to be preferable to you sitting there listening to me make silly mistakes with the technology. On a more mundane matter, in the Family Search blog last weekend, I saw this reference to an article called Finding Your Ancestors with Guided Research. I thought, well, what's this guided research caper? And in the blog, it said, guided research will lead you to successful results in less time and with less effort. It's like having your own professional genealogist coaching you in a journey of discovery. Well, that sounded pretty good, but I still didn't understand why I'd never heard of it before. So I poked around 
and found this reference in the Family Search Research Wiki, which basically says we're rolling this out worldwide, but in a staged fashion. It lists what they're planning to do, and it all sounds incredibly impressive. And there is available a map, and oh, right, oh, yep, all the green in the Northern Hemisphere, that's where it's available. Why would I want that? And I thought, well, hang on. There are a number of countries there that I occasionally get asked questions about, and I really don't know anything about family history research in Italy or Denmark or Belgium. So I'm going to spend some time in the next few weeks exploring this, and uh, maybe some of you would be interested in finding out what this new guided research means. But before I do that, I'm going to take advantage of this offer. You will recall a couple of virtual meetings ago, I contrasted the performance of Find My Past and Ancestry on the same search tasks. I was looking for the births and deaths of the various Cornelia Medwells, and um, I came to a conclusion that it depends, not surprisingly. Well, on the Legacy Family Tree webinars, someone has done a much bigger study and compared Ancestry, Find My Past, with Family Search and My Heritage. And it is available free until October the 28th. Now that's October the 28th in Utah, which is well into Thursday here. So you've got a couple of days. It's an 84 minute webinar, but I find them very easy to watch and listen to. And I reckon it's well worth the time that you might spend on that. And looking even further ahead, QFHS have advertised the next series of courses in their A Beginner's Course in Research. Starts next February, and rather pessimistically, I thought they are planning to offer it online via Zoom, but um, it's certainly a good course. I know that at least one person in our group has done it and felt that it was a very worthwhile activity. Um, so go to the QFHS website and see what's on offer there. And that's the news of the week. As always, if you go to our Notes on Recent Meetings page, I've provided links to any of those that you would want to follow up. Let's pop back here and see, oh, the t this, this, this clock is amazing. It's keeping me on track splendidly. So you just watch the clock ticking while I look over here at the other screen and get set up our next session segment which is cemetery records um, this started out as just a, a piece of my own personal research, and then as I struggled with uh, some of the things that I found, I thought, hmm, maybe some of the lessons that I'm learning here can be passed on to other members of the group. So the presentation finishing up being called Ipswich Cemetery Records, or things I learned while not finding the burial place of my wife's ancestors. So the, the starting point was this wonderful family group. This is the, the Coley family on the right hand side uh, of the image. Philemon Coley who bought the family from the black country in the Midlands to Queensland. On the left his son, at the back his, gra his granddaughter, yes, and at the front his great granddaughter. And we know quite a lot about all these people, but the thing that my wife hadn't found was 
where they were buried. I thought, well, I can easily do that because where the Coley's settled is now called Coleyville. And if you drive down Coleyville Road, then you can turn into Coleyville Cemetery Road. At the end of that, there's a lovely little country cemetery. It's got about a hundred graves in it, all very, very well kept. Um, this will be an afternoon's work to find all the Coleys in the Coleyville Cemetery. And it was going to be even easier than I thought because Queensland Family History Society has included a transcript of the monumental inscriptions in the Coleyville Cemetery in their database for search by members. And you see there, there are 97 entries and I've been told there are about 100 graves. So this is essentially complete coverage. So all I've got to do is type in the surname Coley and there were zero entries. There is not a single person with the name Coley buried in the Coleyville Cemetery. Came as a bit of a problem, but uh, I asked around and the family said, no, no, that's correct. They're all buried up in Ipswich. What, Ipswich Cemetery? Well, up around Ipswich Way. So my quick search of one database fairly rapidly turned into a Google search, Ipswich Cemetery Records Online. What could I find? Well, there's quite a lot. And as I looked through there, I thought, well, if I was in Brisbane, I'd go to BCC Grave Search. If it was in Moreton Bay, I'd go to the free cemetery database. So let's begin with um, Ipswich City Council Cemeteries. It's a very attractive looking web page. Uh, when you scroll down, it shows you photographs of the cemeteries, uh, looking very impressive. Um, there we are. A cemetery search can be conducted by, oh, so you can't do it yourself and you've got to pay for it. Well, that's, that's not my style of family history. So let's go back. And um, what about find a grave up at the top? That looks promising. Let's see what happens when I go there. You can fairly quickly in find a grave, limit your search to one cemetery. So I've gone for the Ipswich General Cemetery and entered the surname Coley. And, oh, two, that's not too bad. Uh, J.T. Coley, yep, he's good. He was the younger brother of um, my wife's grandfather, who was on the left of that photograph that we looked at. And Lily, I think, was probably his wife. Um, so let's have a look at the entry for J.T. Coley. There it is. He's... Ipswich General Cemetery in the Baptist A section, which is puzzling, but we'll come back to that. Um, and quite a nice shot of the headstone by the look of it. And we can read there in loving memory of our dear parents, John T. Coley died September 4th, 1964, and Lily Coley died March 1965. Uh, I should remember Lily's maiden name, but it's fairly easy to find it. I can just jump across to Queensland BDMs and search for a marriage of John Thomas Coley to someone with the given name Lily Mandelkoff. That's right, Lily Mandelkoff. And uh, actually, if I go back to that uh, QFHS database, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, yes, look at all the Mandelkoffs buried in the Coleyville General Cemetery. All except Lily, of course. She married a Coley, so she's not buried in the Coleyville Cemetery. What can I find from the others? Well, find a grave was useful. Let's jump down and have a shot at billion graves next. Basically the same procedure. Select the cemetery, put in the, the surname or the family name Coley. I've left the birth and death years open, run the search 
and there's John T. Coley, but no Lily. And here we've got Ella May Coles. Well, I can understand that a search for Coley might find Coles. So let's open up JT and see what we get. Well, that, that's definitely the same headstone, isn't it? I mean, it's clearly dirty. I'm not sure whether there's moss growing on it. Wonder whether that was photographed before or after the Find the Graves one. But uh, no reference there to his wife in the grave. But if I scroll down the page, it tells me that there's another person on the headstone who may be family buried there in March of 1966. Well, I thought Lily Coley died in 65, but let's have a look. So, mm, if you know it's supposed to be Coley, it's easy to read. If you don't, could you misread it and get the date wrong? You know, in, in, entirely possible. So, the lesson I took from this is that don't say I'm a find a grave person or I'm a billion graves person and I don't need to use the other one. Definitely use the two of them, compare them. You never know who will have something that the other one doesn't. So let's see next up. Uh, yeah, let's try Australian cemeteries. Uh, this is a rather different look. First of all, we need to select a state down the left-hand side. So we'll choose Queensland. And then the cemeteries are listed in alphabetical order. Well, I, I jumped in and clicked I for Ipswich. And then I realised, of course, that not all the Ipswich cemeteries will, in fact, begin with the letter I. I think there was Marburg was one of them. So maybe rather than work through this way, I might do a search. So in the search box at the bottom there, type in the surname Coley, and this is the result that we got. And we'll just point out to you that the only part of that that I typed in was Coley. This section, site, was created by the website. They are using Google Search to search their files. Quite a clever system, not to need uh, your own search engine. And this looks like the Baptist A section, definitely worth exploring. So let's go in there. And here we see it's essentially a spreadsheet. And when we scroll down, there are JT and Lily. No information we didn't have already, but it's confirmation. And um, if I was a fan of Billion Graves and not Find a Grave, it at least would have given me the correct burial date for Lily. Actually, I fibbed a bit when I showed you that it had added site Australian cemeteries because if you allow it to do so, this site searches three places all at once. Its own database, Australian Cemeteries, chapelhill.homeip.net, which is the site created by Kerry Raymond and David Horton, and one called Ausgen Online. And if you allow it to search all three, we finish up with rather more hits. The problem, of course, is that David and Kerry have made a number of references on their site to the Coleyville Cemetery. Here we see the first, the third, uh, and the fourth are all references to Coleyville. They do include the, the name Coley, there just aren't any buried there. And the second entry that we saw on the previous screen has been pushed right off the bottom. So let's go back to it and see what's this Anglican B section. May Coley Parcel. Oh, right. It's not a family name Coley. She has a second given name Coley. 
it might mean an uh, a link to the Coley family, of course. So if I have a quick look, I've got her date of burial, so I should be able to find the death registration. There it is. Mother Emily Cross, Father Thomas Beaumont. Don't recognise any of those names, but um, of course there, there, there was another prominent family of Coley's unrelated to my wife. Maybe she's linked to them. If we go back and look at an individual cemetery in this Australian cemeteries, here we are in the Ipswich General Cemetery, and there's quite a nice um, photograph there showing a, a plan of the cemetery, and it says that you can download it. And unfortunately, when you download it, you realise the plan has been drawn to make it match what's on the picture we're looking at on the left, you've got to turn it upside down, but it's easier if we flip it over. And we see from there that the cemetery has been divided up into denominational sections. The Church of England have a couple, the Roman Catholics have a couple, the Presbyterians have some. And we note that there is one devoted to the Christadelphians. And that's why I was a little puzzled that JT... Coley was buried in the Baptist because I had been given to understand that the Christadelphians were, or that the Coley family, uh, Philemon and his wife Sylvia, when they came to Australia, they were members of the Christadelphian church. And the reason they weren't buried near home was that up at the Ipswich General Cemetery, there was a section set aside for Christadelphians. So we can, in fact, go and have a little click on Christadelphians and see who's buried there. Disappointment, first of all, there are no Coley's in the alphabetical order where I was hoping to find them. Then, a little surprising, the dates of burial are all much later than I'm looking for. I was expecting burials 1900 to 1930 and these are all you know, up to 40, 50, 60 years later. And you notice in the title, this is the Christadelphian B section. Where is the Christadelphian A section? Presumably the first one and where the Coleys are buried. Now, no joy there, I'm afraid. Let's see what else we can find. Interment.net, Ipswich Shire Cemetery Records, looks promising. Let's have a go. This is an international site, so we need to select Australia, Queensland, narrow it down as we go. And here we find they have five cemeteries in the Ipswich Shire, which technically it's, it, it isn't a shire in our local government terms, but this is a, a, an American site, so we'll forgive them for that. Interestingly, none of the names begin with I for Ipswich. So I wouldn't have had too much luck searching for these on uh, the Australian Cemetery site. And if I choose one to have a look at, what we see is a general description of the site by the person who transcribed the headstones and then an alphabetical listing of all of the marked graves in that cemetery. And when I worked through all of them, not a single Coley did I find, but that's okay, because this is reinforcing the idea that they are somewhere in the Ipswich General Cemetery. We've just got to find them. There is a search function on internment not debt. And when I search for Coley Ipswich, I get just one result, and it's for a person who is memorialised on the Menin Gate in Ypres, a First World War soldier. William Coley died September 1917, rifleman in the London Regiment, because the Ipswich, where his parents lived, was in the UK. So because this is an international site, I probably should have in indicated Queensland, or at least Australia in my search, but no Coley's.
Let's proceed into the second column. Uh, a sixth site will be Australian Cemeteries Index, which is not the same as Australian Cemeteries .com.au number four. And here, once again, we can go in, locate the cemetery first, Ipswich General Cemetery. This is a really useful one. It gives us the street address, Cemetery Road in Eastern Heights. It gives us latitude and longitude. And in the description, you notice it talks about who's doing the transcribing, which sections they've done. The bottom paragraph tells us they've gone back to the cemetery and taken more pictures. We've now finished these. Christadelphian B has been done. Uh, sadly, no Christadelphian A by the look of it, but hope springs eternal. So let's call up the name search. Because we have already specified we want in the Ipswich General Cemetery, the number 2751 is already included in there. So let's have a look. Are there any Coley's in there? Oh, there's one. Oh, okay. This is in Ipswich General Cemetery. It is included in the Christadelphian B section. The reason I didn't find it on my previous search, of course, is that Coley was Ruth's maiden name. She was buried as Ruth Steele. But the person who has transcribed this one for us has provided all sorts of interesting information. Now you notice over on the right hand side we have a photograph and a tree. So let's see the photograph first. Very nice photograph of the headstone. Confirms what we had there that uh, Ruth Steele the wife of Richard Steele outlived him by some 20 odd years. Uh, but nice, well, relatively clean headstone, easy to read. Now, what about this tree? I got very excited at this A wonderful collection of information. Then I realized not all of this has come from the cemetery. And certainly it hasn't all come from the headstone. These people who have done this, Paul and Heather Owen, not only do they collect the information off the headstone, they've used her date of burial to work back to a date of death, have identified the registration, which would be 1957 C561. Here we see the second part and 1957 and they have extracted from it details of Ruth's parents, Philemon and Sylvia. Um, spelt variously, Sylvia, Silva, Selva. I don't think um, her writing was terribly good. So this is a wonderful um, site, provides us with much more information than just um, dates of burial, but I still haven't found the people I'm looking for. Let's expand the search a little bit. Let's go to the Family Search Wiki, the Research Wiki, and look for Queensland Cemetery Records. We see that there's some general uh, links there, some specific ones which take us to places we've already been before, but I liked the, um, up in the contents box at the top, Queensland Collections. Have a look at that. And we see that they've gathered together a number of collections of records, not just on Family Search. You see these here that have a dollar sign after them. They are, in fact, on the subscription sites, but Family Search provides a link in case you are interested in following it up. However, I'm always fond of these that don't have a dollar sign, so 
let's see where it takes us. And it is a family search collection. Australia, Queensland Cemetery Records, 1802 to 1990. More than 1.1 million records that you can view, but this isn't one of those exclusively browse records. We can, in fact, search in here. So let's see what that takes us. And here's the search result. It's showing me numbers 1 to 20 of 1,968 results for the name Coley. That seems to me to be rather more than I would have expected. The name is not that common. Perhaps I should have considered clicking here to indicate that I wanted the exact spelling of Coley. Ah, that's more like it. There are now 35 results and one that I can easily uh, work through. Here's Philemon Coley. Um, actually, I was expecting two Philemons, father and son. Let's uh, see. Ah, there we go. Yep, Philemon Coley. Notice I made the mistake here of unticking the exact spelling. So I got a couple of Macaulay's. But oh, hang on. This says he buried... Have they duplicated the same result? Well, let, let's have a look at... Uh, well, let's, let's, let's try this one. Philemon Lewis. Died 9th of July 1915, age 55 years, and buried in Ipswich Cemetery. Well, we're making some progress. Now, what's the other one? Philemon Coley died March... Oh, uh, this is father and son, and they died relatively close together, just a couple of months apart. And they're both buried in the Ipswich Cemetery, as I would have predicted. Uh, this record doesn't tell us where in the cemetery, but uh, let's keep pushing. Scroll down a little and I find... J.T. Coley, burial 1964, that's correct. But again, this odd possibility that we've got duplicate records. J.T. Coley, well, let's have a look at this one first. That's the one that we would expect. It matches the finder grave and the billion graves. Uh, so who are these others? Mrs. Dickfoss. Oh, look, in here, Mr. and Mrs. J.T. Coley are included in the funeral notice as family invited to go. And in fact, if we add the other one, it is another entry for the same funeral of Mrs. Ida Dickfoss, who I think is Lily Coley's grandmother, maternal grandmother. One of the things we need to watch with this family search uh, death records is that not everybody named in it is dead. Well, they're probably dead now. But some of you may remember a couple of years ago, poor Cole having all sorts of trouble wanting to know why family search reckoned that he was dead. And in fact, it wasn't him that was dead, but his name was in a record in the death records. So J.T. Coley isn't buried three times, but in addition to his own burial record, he is named in records of other family members. So where to... Nope. I've got to activate that screen first. Right, so we've been through seven of them started with the proposition that the family was probably in the Ipswich General Cemetery. The evidence is lining up that that's where they are, but we don't really have anything better yet. So uh, what will we try now? Oh, this, this is an interesting one. This is a story in the Queensland Times about people working in the, in the Ipswich General Cemetery 
locating unmarked graves and here this uh, volunteer is working with a metal detector because there are the little metal markers which we used when there wasn't a stone have become buried over the years and by locating them under the ground he is able to find information on missing graves. There wasn't a lot of useful information in the story except that once the project is completed, all the information collated will be placed online through the Ipswich Library. And residents with pictures can send them to Picture Ipswich. File that one away. I may need that information. Well, let's go down to the bottom here. Forebears.io. This was a new one to me, so I was quite optimistic. Maybe they had something that no one else did. Never seen it before, but it, it does clearly give you the option of sorting by place. So I went in and narrowed it down. Australia, Queensland, South East Queensland, City of Ipswich on the, on the left side of the screen. And down the main body, we had a number of records that they could provide me with access to. Let's try Queensland funeral records. Oh, they provide a link to find my past. And another link to find my past for Queensland burials and memorials. And a link to ancestry for Australia death index. So um, this site is useful if you are looking for a quick set of links, but they don't appear to have any of their own information in four bears. Which brings us to the one that I've skipped over, you noticed. Number 10, burial registers in the Ipswich General Cemetery. This, and it's of course part of archivesearch.qld.gov.au. Now, this is where uh, we reveal just how long it takes me to put some of these talks together. Because I began doing this one back in January. Uh, I haven't been working on it continuously, but the giveaway is that I used the old search. So let's have a quick look at what I found with the old archive search. We'll dust the cobwebs off. I went in and I searched for Ipswich General Cemetery using all of the words. And it showed me one agency, one series, nine items. So click on view the results for the items and looks pretty good. Register of burials by date, 1868 to 1889. Um, this one is probably the one that I'm after. Uh, Register of Burials 1906 to 1921. Certainly Philemon and his son Philemon Lewis were both buried in 1915. They ought to be in there. Let's see where it... And it is a microfilm. Shows a bit down the bottom, or it does if I get that out of the way. There it is, a microfilm ID down the bottom. No digital image, I'm afraid. So that was the old archive search. Can I replicate it with the new one? So this is the new or the current archive search. And I can't just simply say Ipswich General Cemetery using all of the words. I've got to put it in over three lines. I want to search for Ipswich and General and Cemetery. If I put them all in the same box, what I'll get is Ipswich or General or Cemetery, and it'll tell me that it's found about half the total records at Runcorn. I've specified that I'm searching for an item, and I want open records. No point showing me records that I'm not allowed to look at. And this is what we get. And it's looking quite promising. Register of Burials, General Cemetery. There are 11 results. Actually, more than I got uh, with the old search. And very usefully, over here on the right-hand side, 
I can limit it to just burial registers. Well, that's useful. I'll click on that. And while I was doing that, I thought, well, why not scroll down the bottom here and limit by date? So I've closed it off between 1882 and 1936, which is the period when I, it's somewhat broader than the period when I was actually expecting to find burials, just in case we get some early or late. And remembering, of course, that this won't show JT because he lived to a prodigious age. But um, so I can now identify, here's our 1906 to 1921. I can view the item. And it shows me that there are in fact two items with different IDs. And we know that this is because now the archive search indicates both the microfilm version, which we've got down the bottom here, and the original paper version. Um, I am imagining that the senior archivist won't let me play with the paper because it's fragile, so I would be interested in the microfilm. But just to check how well my searching held up, here's the reference with the, the new search. And here's what I found with the old search. And I'm pleased to say that I was able to locate the same microfilm pre and post improvement. So maybe I'm getting better at dealing with the, the details of the new archive search. But what comes next? Well, I'm going to have to book a session out at Runcorn to be able to look at those microfilms. Or maybe go a little further afield, get myself on a train to Ipswich, because in this corner of the map of the cemetery, I'm pretty sure that the area I've marked is called the Old Christadelphian. There is no Christadelphian A section but that looks like part of the original cemetery. They're beside the old Methodists and the old Lutherans, which would have suited the Coleys right down to the ground because Christadelphians were Methodists. And down at Coleyville, he was surrounded by Lutherans. So I suspect I may need to walk that section of the cemetery and see what I can find. And of course, while I'm at Ipswich, Ipswich Genealogical Society has their catalogue online and they've got some very interesting looking books that uh, I definitely should go in and have a look at. You remember when I looked at the Queensland Times article, it said picture Ipswich. Um, I haven't had time to look at this in great detail, but those of you who liked what I showed on Flickr last virtual meeting probably should go and have a look at Picture Ipswich within the Ipswich Library to see what photos they may have that you can use. And when I go into the Ipswich Library and search for the cemetery, I get quite a lot of hits from their library, including the Ipswich General Cemetery Register of Burials, March 1906 to the 29th of January. I view the availability. I, I wonder, will, it, will, they, will they just tell me to go to the State Archives and have a look? Oh no, it says, view the resource online. Although the State Archives doesn't have this register online, it looks like Ipswich City Council Library does. So let's have a look. Oh my goodness. You can see why I thought that the, the archivists at QSA wouldn't let me play with this one. And it is going to be a major task to look through that. But I certainly am able to download a PDF of this register 
and um, brew myself up a big pot of coffee and start looking. And then, well, I started out thinking, quick afternoon job, go upstairs and say, look, dear, aren't I clever? Um, look what I found. I haven't actually found anything that I was looking for, but by gee, I've learned an awful lot about the characteristics of the different types of sites which would provide us with um, um, information on burials. And uh, as they say, you learn an awful lot by making mistakes. So that whoop, is my Ipswich Cemetery Records. Uh, we'll just exit that. Get rid of that. And jump down here because while I reach desperately for my coffee cup, I think it's time. Okay, now you are looking at me and I can use my other screen to go in here and find out where the two minute tip has gone. There it is. Yep, that's it. Okay. when you're entering data in Legacy Family Tree, you finish creating an event fact for one ancestor, such as Teddy Bear here, where you see we have a residence fact. We can edit to see the details. And then you realize that other members of the Bear family lived at the same place at the same time. Now, Legacy does have the power to share an event with other people. But some users prefer not to use that because it can be a little confusing. If Sometimes when you're entering data in Legacy Family Tree, you finish creating an event fact for one ancestor, such as Teddy Bear here, where you see we have a residence fact, we can edit to see the details, and then you realize that other members of the Bear family lived at the same place at the same time. Now, Legacy does have the power to share an event with other people, but some users prefer not to use that because it can be a little confusing if you export in GEDCOM format. So, I close that, and feel that they need to retype all of this information for each other member of the family, but they don't need to. If you look down here at the bottom right corner, these clipboard icons, and we click on copy the event to the clipboard, save for teddy bear twice, switch our focus from teddy bear to his son Paddington. At this stage, Paddington doesn't have any facts, but we can open up the page and add an event fact. But once you see this screen, don't begin to type. Come back down to the icons and select P. 
paste the event. And all of the information that we had for Teddy Bear is now inserted for his son Paddington. Notice even the citation for the source has been carried over. Save, save, and decide who else in the family you might need to enter it for. Perhaps Mama or some of the other children. Much easier than retyping. Well, I hope... Whoop. I hope that you got the audio and the video there. Uh, I suspect there was a little blip at the beginning. And once again, if you want to watch that one, you can go to have a look at our uh, More Hints page. Uh, sadly, I'm losing the fight with the clock. So let's move very quickly to the final two segments so that those people who have to go aren't horribly disadvantaged. Um, we want to bring up homework there and we want to swap that screen to there. And here you see a reminder of something we did a couple of weeks ago where we looked at how to um, search the Sydney Morning Herald archives. Um, let's activate that screen. Whoop. And you remember we could browse and search. A few days later in the tween meeting news, I posted some questions challenged you, can you find the answers to these? Now, I know some of you have had that moment of excitement that we all remember from the classroom where you thought, the teacher's forgotten about the homework. He's not going to check it. Well, he hasn't forgotten it, but he's not going to check it either. But what I will do is um, select a small portion of a video which I've made answering all of those questions, show it to you as a bit of a teaser or a trailer. One of the tasks was this one. A certain Mr. Tuppen was a member of the board of an Australian chocolate manufacturer. So we need to have a look at whoop, over here. I need uh, that one there. I need to turn that on and turn that off. Oh, what am I doing there? Uh, and start. No. Hmm. Search number three. A certain Mr. Tuppen was a member of the board of an Australian chocolate manufacturer when it was subject to takeover bids from both an American and a British rival. What were the names of the three companies? Who won control? And when was the report published? This question requires a search function again. So we bring it up and clear all to remove all the traces of our last search because we don't want to confuse them. And I think we want to find all these words, Mr. Tuppen and chocolate. We could possibly throw in takeover as well, but 
that might not be the word that was used. So what if we put in takeover or acquisition or buyout? Now, I don't need to type the ors in there because it says any of these words. And let's launch our search. And it gives us exactly one result, which is always a very nice thing to find. And there's two of our answers in the headline. McRobertson's chocolate was the board. They favoured the bid by the British company Cadbury's. And down here in the small text, the rival American bidder was Mars, maker of Mars bars. If you wanted more detail, we can open the article view. And there it is. Mr. C.W. Toffin was a member of the board of McRobertson's Chocolates. It looks as though he was the only member of the board who wasn't a member of the family of the founders. And uh, if we look in the detail of the story, the correct name for the British owned company was Cadbury Fry Pascal, based in Hobart. Well, it's uh, not horribly after 10 o'clock. And if you are interested in those uh, five challenges on the Sydney Morning Arc. Sydney Morning Herald archive. On our notes on recent meetings page, you'll find links which will take you to the video of the, the section where we talked about how to search, the five questions, and the subsequent video on my solution to how to work them out. Um, so if you're at a loose end this afternoon, perhaps that will uh, fill up the rest of your day. Uh, because we're running a little over time, we'll skip that last two minute tip, save it up for later, and let's move straight through to coming up and have a look at what's on the calendar. Um, first up, of course, you've just missed the start of Cara's talk, Quarantined in Queensland, over at Cannon Hill at 10 o'clock but I'm still a chance of finishing up here and scrambling over there for the two o'clock session. Looking forward to that quite a lot. Um, on Friday, of course, there's the Lawton Cemetery walking tour with Kelly. That is booked out, has been for many weeks, but if you are booked in, great thing, don't forget to go down there. Although I did hear a little whisper that perhaps a film crew has been following Kelly around and we may get to see a video version of the Lawton Cemetery as well. Um, now what was supposed to happen, let's jump through here because some clown got the slides out of order. The 10th of November comes next and of course it's our face-to-face -face meeting in the library. As I said at the outset, watch your email for details on how to um, express your preference. Um, there won't be any big uh, presentation in that meeting, just a chance to sit around and chat, catch up, chat with colleagues and talk about what you found and the frustrations of researching in this year. And of course, we'll need to finalise uh, the arrangements for marking the end of year. And quickly, if we run back through to get ourselves in calendar order, the ten after the meeting at the library on the 10th, there is a Zoom meeting with Peter Dunn, OAM, to mark Remembrance Day, Wednesday the 11th. Uh, book through your library account. There will be a link on the notes on recent meetings page. The following Friday the 13th, Greg Hallam, Queensland Rail Historian, talking about the railway to Kilcoy. Once again, um, book. This one will be through Teams, but uh, you really won't notice any difference. Um, the 24th, of course, is our picnic in the park. Um, and believe it or not, that marks the end of the year 
and we've got a um, some holidays and February the 9th 2021 um, we are scheduled to end your relaxing holiday because of course however bad you feel at the end of the holidays you know you'll enjoy it when you get back to the library and this one was scheduled for February 23 um, I spoke to Helen about the possibility that we might move that a little bit and um, after I prepared this slide Helen got back to me and said Sadie Thompson Dwyer who is going to present it for us is very happy to move that back into March so that'll be February 20 March 23 Tuesday March 23 Love Day Finn some of you will remember having seen that before if you haven't well worth coming along um, but we will have three ordinary meetings uh, well as ordinary as we can make them before we invite Sadi in in March and uh, once again don't forget don't be sitting in front of your uh, computer on uh, the 10th because you should be in the car park down at Station Road um, so um, It's been great fun uh, presenting these. Sometimes it hasn't seemed like it when uh, the sound went wrong, or but uh, I have enjoyed doing it. And thank you to those people who've uh, joined in with me and uh, put up with all of my blunders, especially to Paul for his work in contributing those uh, three recorded pieces which has uh, at least broken up the monotony of listening to me all the time um, I'll see you at the library in two weeks time bye everybody